This episode of the Design Your Dream Home podcast is brought to you by CRAN. CRAN is the Custom Residential Architects Network and by Porcelanosa. Porcelanosa is a luxury lifestyle brand that brings modern European design into your home. You are listening to the Design Your Dream Home podcast with Doug and Steve. Doug and Steve are architects and they're here to help you design your dream home. So today we are thrilled to have Mary Cerrone um, from Pennsylvania. Are you from Pittsburgh? Or Pittsburgh yes. Pennsylvania? Okay, great. That's right. That's right. But Mary is a architect. She's principal of Pittsburgh-based MCAI, which I assume is Mary Cerrone Architecture and Interiors. Correct. Her experience includes private, commercial, institutional clients and encompasses single and multifamily new construction, renovations, additions, and interiors. That's all residential. She served, She uh, received her undergraduate degree in architecture from the University of Virginia and her master's degree from Yale. She is licensed in Pennsylvania and she served on the boards of AIA Pittsburgh, that's the American Institute of Architects, and is an active member of the AIA Custom Residential Architect Network, which we call CRAN. And finally, Mary has taught design and drawing at Savannah College of Art and Design and also at Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Great to hey, have you, Mary. So we want to, uh, first of all, we want to mention just uh, briefly that CRAN, um, again, the Custom Residential Architect Network is now partnering with Doug and Steve, the Design, and Design Your Dream Home uh, podcast with Doug and Steve. And uh, we know that you're on that board, so we want to thank you for your role in that. And maybe you could just talk, before we talk about your work, just a little bit about what, uh, what CRAN is and what CRAN does and why you are working with us. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so CRAN, as you said, is the Custom Residential Architects Network. It is a knowledge community of the AIA. And so for people who may not know how this works, the AIA is... Um, kind of like an umbrella organization, the American Institute of Architects. And within it, there are about 21, I think, knowledge communities. So let's say if you primarily do healthcare work or schools, you, you might sign up for that knowledge community. Well, our knowledge community serves those who work in the residential world. And um, so we are a relatively new knowledge community. I think we were um, launched in 2011, but we have been... Um, despite our, our relatively young age, we've been a really successful knowledge community. We do a whole lot of stuff throughout the year. Probably our biggest thing we do is the annual symposium. And, um, you know, if you want, I can tell you more about that. Um, or I can just leave it at that and let people check out Cran's website. <laughs> and Where's the symposium this year, Mary? It's going to be in Scottsdale, Arizona. So we're going to be seeing a lot of, uh, mid-century modern things just because of the region that we're going to be in um we're going to see uh we're going to be at taliesin arcasanti we've got an event planned at the biltmore hotel and uh we've also got a great home tour lineup of uh kind of quote historic historic for scottsdale you know homes as well as more contemporary homes so i think um i, th I think we we've probably will have another really excellent symposium. So I'm looking forward to it. I've been to a couple and they're a lot of fun. I really they, enjoy the they people. They are. They yeah. are a lot of fun. I'm glad that you think so. I think that's one of the main reasons why we have a lot of regulars that come back because yeah. it's like summer camp for residential <laughs> architects. They <laughs> see it. their old friends once a year and they get together and they swap stories and they go to dinner and so forth. And it's, you know, there's a lot of learning that happens because we do have really great speaker sessions and really great home tours, but then there's also just a lot of fun and casual interaction and networking. Yeah, it's great. It's great to show up in one place and everybody understands your problems. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because when I very first got involved with Crayon, I kind of felt like, oh my gosh, these people understand all my problems, <laughs> you know, and it's so true because if you're just a kind of generic member of the AIA and you do residential, you, you can almost start to feel like you just are, you know, a random architect or, you know, yeah. you're just not really part of the program. And so once you find this little club, it's, yeah, it's like you've entered into this little magical world and you, 
you realize that uh, you're not alone. And, you know, having said that, the other neat thing about CRAN is we do have a really diverse group of architects. You know, we've got people that are doing design build and, you know, run significant design build firms. And then we've got, you know, sole practitioners. And um, so, you know, not everybody is like doing and experiencing exactly the same thing, but, you know, more or less we're kind of in the same world. Right. Yeah, well, we're excited to um, partner with CRAN. And what we mean by that is that now CRAN, uh, we will have a number of podcasts, another, a number of CRAN members uh, be guests on our show. And I think that we think that this is a good alignment. So we're really happy to be working with you guys. And you are our first CRAN member. Actually, no, we've had other CRAN members, but I think you're our you first have. official yeah, CRAN. And, yeah. Yeah. Right. They just happen to be CRAN members. Right. People first right. one since we yeah. decided to work together. Yeah, okay, I'm awesome. really, really happy that we've we've made this arrangement. I think it's going to be uh, a great, you know, a great resource um, both ways. Right so win-win. So, okay, so now we have to take all good info from Cran and from us and and now uh, help homeowners. So um, we'd love to learn more about um, about your work, uh, your work as an architect. And, you know, I saw something about your design philosophy, but maybe I'll let you explain, you know, your approach. Okay, I probably should have read what it was before talking to you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, if I have a philosophy, it's with a lowercase p and not an uppercase p. But um, I think it was all caps on your website. Oh, yeah. It was all it was caps, like design and exclam- philosophy was caps. It was just like, exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> smiley face, smiley face. Um, no, uh, so... Uh, I, I guess if I had to step way back and say, well, you know, what is my kind of wider range philosophy is that I try to take more of the long look at buildings. And I guess I can maybe back this up by saying that uh, when I first got into architecture, I was really interested in archaeology. And I also worked for HABS, the Historic American Building Survey. And um, if anybody knows what they do, they measure and document historic buildings. And so Mm. that's sort of what I cut my teeth on. And so to me, that's one of the things that's really, really fascinating about being an architect is the way that a building is, I mean, in the same way that an archaeologist would find studying a city or a building interesting, is that it's such a repository for all the all the layers of change and an understanding of, you know, who we are and what we leave behind. Um, so at that level, I've always found architecture really exciting. Now, do I tell clients this? No, because they would just say like, uh, what are you <laughs> talking about? But it still ends up kind of affecting the way I look at things, which is to say that I tend to maybe not be as concerned or, wrapped up in trying to, you know, pull off a particular style, so to speak, or, you know, aim for something that's going to look really trendy and, oh, you know, you got to do this and you got to do that. I, I guess I'm, for whatever reason, just less drawn to that aspect of architecture. Um, come from a sort of, you know, builder and engineering background. My father was a civil engineer and you know, when his family came over to the United States, they just became contractors, you know, so they, you know, participated in the, all the building of houses in Long Island and that sort of thing. So, you know, I came up, that's sort of the back, my family kind of background. So, um, so I came into architecture, I guess, in a somewhat random path. I didn't, I wasn't like a lot of people where they said, oh, I always knew I wanted to be an architect. I did not, because I really didn't even know what architects did. I didn't know any architects. I'm from West Virginia. I didn't, you know, have a lot of exposure to the kinds of things that, you know, somebody living somewhere else might perhaps. But at any rate, um, when I went to college, I met people in my dorm who were studying architecture. And I thought, oh, this is so interesting because I've always been interested in archaeology. And then I kind of like, you know, latched onto them. And then I decided to transfer into the architecture school and so forth. So I guess this is a really long and rambling answer. (laughs) So how did you get a job with the Historic American Building Survey? I'm familiar with the work because when I make all these videos, I'm always on the Library of Congress. And they're yeah. all these, I mean, they're all Habs photos and they're 
Yeah. It's amazing. I wish there were more. And I, I, I'm sorry. I wish there were more that were digitized, but it's an oh, interesting organization. You can actually, um, yeah. So I've actually found the drawings I did somehow online through the Library of Congress. Wow. Um, and I oddly even found a picture of me when I was like 20 or something or, you know, jo documenting because I measured the, uh, the dome oh in the uh, courthouse in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, it's like 1772. Uh, wood frame, uh, heavy timber peg, like pegged joinery dome. So it's a pretty cool structure. But um, I, I learned about it when I, you know, there was just a, what, that thing called a job board, which was a bulletin board on a wall with tacks and, you know, little, little <laughs> signs on it. And that was how people got information back, back in the 1980s. So yeah, right. you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, this job looks interesting. You know, I applied for it. Yeah. And how long did you work for th for them? It, it was it was just a summer job. That's all. It okay. Was. But it was one of these like Im almost like immersive activities. You know, I just learned I learned so much from yeah. doing it about you know looking looking at buildings and understanding how they you know how they go together technically. And when you measure something, you tend to get pretty you know intimate with it, and you you kind of learn a lot about it. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, so that was sort of how I got started and things. And for our listeners, there are th literally thousands and thousands and thousands of drawings and photographs of not only architecture, but just historical information, uh, events and buildings and all kinds of things on the Library of Congress. Just go to librarycongress.com or oh. .gov, I guess. Yeah, yeah. okay, right, right, yep. good point. So this this yep. might be a, this might be a, a kind of a, a leap that... Um, that's sort of dumb, but that's what I do. So because of this interest in archaeology, does that mean that you have interest in historic preservation and renovation, uh, renovation of existing buildings, that sort of thing? Well, I definitely do do a lot of that. And part of that is because of the market that I'm in. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm in, uh, I live in Pittsburgh. We have a lot of close in neighborhoods that have you know, old houses that are in you know, desirable neighborhoods that like essentially never really tanked in value. So they've kind of been stable for decades and, you know, people want to live in the neighborhoods. And so there's just kind of like pretty, pretty regular demand for people wanting to improve these houses or add on to them or fully gut them and, you know, completely do them over. So having said that, I, I, I don't take like a capital H capital P historic preservation approach to a lot of these things because you know it isn't necessarily the uh, appropriate path mm -hmm. um you know if you're dealing with a homeowner and they're trying to make the house work for the 21st century so um but um but it can depend you know some homeowners want it more than others so I, I'm flexible. Well, well, well let's 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 gear this to our homeowner. Let's say that there's a homeowner in Pittsburgh that buys a a nice older home, but it's clearly not working for you know a current family. Let's say, and they say, well, what should we do? How should we approach this? Should we make the should we make it completely modern inside, or should we look at what's there? Like, how do they approach it? I kind of how do you or if they ask you, like, what should we do? What do you tell them? Uh, I look at it as a, on a case by case basis. Oftentimes, the houses have it, it depends on the house, um, like what its original stature was. Many of the houses were not great houses to begin with. Okay. You know, they were sort of like ordinary worker type houses. They're decent houses, they're pleasant enough, but they don't have any like wealth of, you know, gorgeous moldings or, you know, beautiful plaster detailing or anything. So in some respects, I don't feel bad saying, yeah, just, just scrap it all. You know, there's not really nothing of tremendous value here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, oftentimes even the windows aren't even that great. So in some cases, yeah, you get blank slate. And so you can say, let's just do what we want. Other times, you know, you may have a rumor like, oh man, this is just you know, beautiful white oak wainscoting you know, three quarter high around the room, you know, it would just be a shame to rip this mm -hmm. out. So let, let's, let's work with this, you know, so it's, it depends. So there certainly are a lot of houses that have a lot of elaborate, um, you know, materials and detailing to them, but then there's just a, way more that are just what I can, would consider ordinary houses. 
So right. there's, a, there's an assessment. Sorry, Doug. There's an I'll, I'll finish. So there's an assessment that you do where you walk the house. Let's say there might be woodwork, there might be moldings, there might be nicer materials, there might be certain decorative features, things that you think have value. And then in that case, you would say, hey, we should kind of work with these. And maybe in some of these worker homes, maybe it's pretty actually pretty straightforward. There's really nothing special going on. And that's where you say, you know, hey, there's nothing of redeeming value here. Let's just go ahead and give yeah. it a new identity, something like that. Exactly, exactly. And then keep in mind also, there was that era of the 70s when people, you know, thought they were improving these nice old houses. So oftentimes, all somebody's already gone through and, and you know, sort of scarred things. And, you know, so you're, you're trying to remove all the bad stuff. And there's not so they've already stripped things. You know, so oftentimes that's the case. So it's like, well, you know, it's already been destroyed. We might as well just try to make it nice again. But there's mm -hmm. nothing left to bring back because, you know, 40 years ago, somebody went through and ripped all this stuff out. Right. So, you, you know, it's you, you see patterns, but nonetheless, every project is unique. I, I was simply going to add uh, in my experience so the moldings are a big deal, right? I mean, you get some of these homes and the interiors are absolutely wonderful. And the exterior materials can be quite wonderful too. But the challenges that I find with these homes, and I wanted to ask you about this, was the insulation values. Oh, yeah. How do homeowners know yep, yep. when they look at a window that it's not really going to work? It might feel cold, but why? And the yep. walls, why are yep. these issues? And the, yep. even the roof materials, these beautiful slate roofs that are oh, yeah. kind of the end of their life. So could you talk a little bit about that? Now, remember how you said you talked you, when you got to Korea and you realized you met all these people that shared all your problems yeah. well yeah. <laughs> you just shared a bunch of my problems uh, <laughs> that is that is a big part of what i do and it you know it's it doesn't sound like you know exciting but it's as much a component and it's as valuable to making a good house as the architecture you know having heat and when you think about it, when these houses were built they were just sort of marginally comfortable you know, people expect it to be miserably hot in them in the summer and to be cold in the winter. And that's just the way it was. And, you know, maybe there were some horse hair stuffed here and there so a pipe wouldn't burst. But, you know, otherwise, <laughs> things were pretty rudimentary. Right. Well, now when you take things apart and you want to build them back in such a way that they have a much higher performance in terms of like the thermal envelope, well, as you know, you introduce all kinds of issues having to do with vapor and moist, you know, moisture and uh, vapor being trapped in walls and, and so forth. So, you know, you really have to be very careful with all the building science stuff so that you are putting the assembly back together in a way that is not going to lead to rot. The, the old houses breathed so much, you know, because the, mm -hmm. you know, everything was just flowing in and out of them that generally speaking, their, their insides didn't rot. But um, you, you have to be careful if you don't do it right, you can potentially, you know, create a long term problem for the homeowner. This is something that your average homeowner has absolutely no idea about. In fact, uh, you know, they just it, it amazes me how how often homeowners have only like the most minimal understanding of, of insulation. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'd like to have it insulated. And I just think to myself, boy, you know, homeowners are, have gotten way more savvy in the last 20, 30 years just because of the Internet in terms of the kinds of look they want or the kinds of features they want. And even being able to talk about design, you know, some of these homeowners, they can talk to you about design. You feel like you're almost having like a little crit session with them, with your, with the professor, but it amazes me. And, and some of them are, you know, science and tech type people, you know, they're, they're smart people. They're, they're STEM type people, but they really don't have a whole lot of knowledge, working knowledge about something that is sort of pretty basic, which is, has to do with insulation and, you know, keeping, keeping a building airtight. And so, um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of education that goes into all of it. And, you know, none of this is exciting or fun or, you know, like you can't make splashy pictures out of it, but if you fail that, then, you know, the other stuff is just, you know, you're just putting lipstick on things. 
know, you, you can't not address them. The, I always feel like, you know, architects like to just, many of them, not all of them, but many of them like to sort of downplay mundane things. And this would be maybe characterized as a mundane thing. Now, there are a lot of other mundane things like keeping water out, um, you know, having stairs that are reasonable to use and, you know, so forth. And, but I feel like oftentimes mundane things are not given enough attention. And if you look at, you know, ancient architecture, you know, it's basically, it's the mundane things which have made it what it was, you know, it's, it's like the very basic act of keeping the water out, you know, creating some shelter, you know, the, 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 the few simple moves that they did to try to achieve that. Well, that was the architecture, you know, so I feel like you can get, you can, you know, potentially get a lot of mileage out of simply addressing the mundane things because you have to do that in any way, you know, if you don't, then you're in trouble. This episode of the Design Your Dream Home podcast is brought to you by Cran. Cran is the Custom Residential Architects Network. Cran is the leading resource and voice for architects who focus on collaborative design with homeowners. Cran provides support, advocacy, and education for custom residential projects, as well as professional development for its members via forums, symposia, publications, and local activities. To learn more about CRAN, visit www.aia.org forward slash CRAN. This episode of the Design Your Dream Home podcast is brought to you by Porcelanosa. With 30 showrooms in the United States and Canada, Porcelanosa is a luxury lifestyle brand that'll make your next project's dream into a reality. From a wide selection of tiles and mosaics to modern bathroom and kitchen cabinetry designs, Porcelanosa makes it easy to bring modern European design elements into your home. Visit porcelanosa-usa.com to learn more. So, you know, it, what, what you say is interesting because, um, I mean, you're right. I mean, I think that a lot of architects, we feel like <clears throat> pressure to do something exciting and different. And sometimes you kind of don't put as much attention on these things, which I, I assume homeowners think we know inside and out, <clears throat> and which we may. It's just that um, in that search, search for something different, um, sometimes these things get less attention than they need. So I'm glad you're underscoring that. Um, so question for you. This is, this is something that comes up when someone's doing a home renovation, and I think it's it's always really difficult, but I'm curious to hear how you respond. So someone says, hey, I wanna do this to my existing home. How much is it gonna cost? Mm. What do you tell them? Mm. Oh yes, the other, the other big problem in my world. Um, generally, it will cost way more than what you think it's gonna cost. And it's not gonna cost what you found on an online price calculator that you, you know, <laughs> because you're a computer scientist and you know everything and you know how to use these things that tells you exactly what this home thing's gonna cost. And I mean, I've had homeowners literally prepare these things and lay it down on the table with the contractor and say, well, you know, I don't understand where you're getting this number from because I went online and I did this calculator and, you know, drywall should cost this. and. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, again, it's, it's another, it's like we live in another world and they just, most people don't know what this world is like. And it, to some extent, it's just a matter of education. And it's interesting to me though, that once the client gets it and sees the kind of work that a good conscientious contractor will put into one of these jobs, they totally see the value in it and they get it. And then when they do more work, because I have a lot of repeat clients or repeat projects, they will use that same builder again because the trust has been established. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to convey, you know, I'm not sure a robot's ever going to be able to do it for us, but that, you know, oh, well, exactly how much labor it takes to, you know, take apart and now level the floors. And, um, you know, to deal with just all the issues that you, you come up with. And so it, it is, uh, uh, it is just by nature, more costly work and, um, homeowners are never quite prepared. Electrical is often a big sticker shock. You know, it's not uncommon to have, you know, a, 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 again, you know, in the old days, oh, you know, you had a few electrical outlets in the room and a couple of switches and that, Hey, you were, you were living really really well and you know now when people we have to rewire houses and you know do 
bring in, I mean, you know, nobody would ever want anything less than a 200 amp service, right? Well, you know, it wasn't that long ago when most people just had 100 amp services and that was, you know, that was a world of plenty. So our appetites for, you know, energy and everything has greatly increased. And um, so when you get into this, you know, essentially rebuilding a house from the inside out and now you're wiring it all, but in many cases, the entire house isn't stripped. So that doesn't make it easier for the electrician. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is that oftentimes these whole house rewiring, stripping and rewiring jobs, I mean, they're, they're, they can be really expensive and therefore can represent a seemingly disproportionate chunk of the overall budget. So right. Mary, when you are working with your clients, how do you get them to the right contractor if they don't know who they want to use? We talked about how important it is to use the right contractor. Gosh, that is, you know, that is, you're just kind of hitting on all the hot button items here. That is another really challenging thing. Um, you know, we've all been on the job where somebody's brought in the contractor that, you know, oh, my buddy used this guy and he was fine. And, you know, you you start working with the guy, he's a nice enough guy and everything, but you pretty quickly realize that, you know, you're you're in for a rough ride. And, you know, you're like, oh, man, I am dreading CA on this job because you know, <laughs> this person is just not is not a problem solver, not a partner. It's more of a, you know, slam, bam, let me get out kind of thing. So. Um, honestly, I have, I have just basically built up relationships with subs and contractors over the last 25 years. Okay. And, uh, I try to essentially maintain all those relationships and expand them to the greatest extent possible. So anytime I work with somebody who's like, you know, good stone guy, good tile guy, whatever, you know, I, I bring them into my circle (laughs) and, um, it is actually one of the values that architects offer because I very often hear a good point. Say, you know, they say, you know, I don't know how to find anybody to do this work. And when I try, no one returns my calls. I can't get anybody to talk to me. You know, one of the main reasons they'll say, you know, that we want you to help us is not just because, you know, we like your designs and, you mm-hmm. know, so-and-so referred you to us. But, you know, we know that you have access to people who can do good work and, you know, you can connect us to them. And I explained to them, yes, but these aren't going to be the cheapest guys. But, you know, it's it's kind of um, it's just a matter of, you know, ultimately you get what you pay for. And, you know, and obviously people sometimes have to make decisions. They have to make cuts. They have to prioritize and say, well, you know, we, we can't do it all. So how do we? How do we uh, rank our our uh, our wish list, so to speak, and you know how we try to manage? It? I try to do as much as that upfront as I can because um, it's just no fun when somebody thinks they're gonna, you know, buy the whole car and they realize they can only buy one seat. You know, <laughs> oh, I don't want to have to now take your car apart and sell you a bike. You know, I mean, I just want to. You know, so it's better to educate them up front so you're not wasting time and being inefficient with yeah. uh, shepherding a project through. And so along along these lines, uh, I, I was asking you a leading question before about um, trying to figure out the price of renovations. I mean, things that can happen, contractor opens up a wall and says, whoa, look what's going on here. And I often, yeah. if the homeowner is not with an, with an architect, the, the contractor can say, well, this is going to cost twice what we talked about. And the homeowners can say, what can they do? They're sort of stuck at that moment. And this is where yep. an architect can say, look, I think we need to kind of talk here. And I think what I'm looking at is should be about this. And I think that's a huge value where homeowners kind of left with, I don't really know what to do here, but this is something that we did not anticipate that no, nobody have could, could have known until we opened up the walls, which is why, again, we don't know the cost of renovations. But so we open it up. And then again, without an architect, homeowner is really left at the contractor saying, well, that's what it is. If you don't want me to do it, I'll see you later. Right. So um, this is a case where it's really great to have someone on your team that can advocate for you, be your agent and say, Look, based on my experience, this is what needs to be done. This is the ballpark. This is how long we think it should take. And there's going to be problems like this all the way through. I mean, it really is so many surprises with a renovation, especially an older house. Yeah, and to the greatest extent possible, you try to um, 
kind of field as many of the problems in advance because just from experience you say mm -hmm. well you know i've been through this house before you know i know I, you know chances are we're going to find this and chances are mm -hmm. we're going to have to do that and but but you're right sometimes yeah there is some kind of really big weird surprise like you know sometimes you open up a house and you say oh boy why did the framing now right. change directly you know like you right. think it's going to be framed one way based on the logic of the way the first floor is framed and then you get to the second floor and, it's, and you open it up and you're like it's framed so differently and so weirdly why did they frame it this way we don't know it's interesting you know like you what you let you start digging around you think well why did they frame it this way you know was it had something to do with whatever you know lengths of wood they could get or whatever but you know you so and so anyway sometimes you have to make structural changes because you're like well guess we won't be framing it the way we thought we were because it's all running completely the other direction or whatever we so. did a house one time where we were looking around and we said you know there are no anchor bolts to the foundation this house is basically just <laughs> resting on gravity on the foundation oh my gosh, like yeah. whoever builder did this house never actually yeah. connected it to the foundation i mean i wow. think we should do that now it's like okay it's, we am do that. <laughs> it's amazing Slide how right you find stuff that and one of one of the engineers i work with he's his explanation for a lot of this stuff is um i i call it the bird's nest you know which was which, which is like wood frame houses are like kind of like a bird's nest you know it's just a bunch of twigs and they're all holding themselves together because oftentimes we'll open stuff up and we'll all scratch our heads and say how's this part of the house still standing it's the bird's nest effect and then the, one of the engineers says it's because of habit and he, he describes it you know like the house just has a habit of standing so it knows to stand even mm. though you know if he you know he could never design it this way and you know would never pass or meet code or get you know a permit but you know stuff just seems to hold together and you know when you find those things you try to fix them to the best of your ability but yeah sometimes you look at them you're like huh how has this not fallen down <laughs> huh. and people who are living here and have been you know right for been, a long time but, yeah so Mary, it's, just, I, I, it's the I think bird nest Okay, so I think we've actually have like two tips without really even really trying to do that. But um, right, we have something about um, uh, um, something about renovating existing houses. Something about um, finding the right contractor. Is that also fair to say that costing we more than you think do? it's gonna? <laughs> Be realistic about your costs. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm not saying anything new here, but you yeah. know, don't believe those uh, home remodeling shows where people you know they're kind of like the equivalent of cooking shows right. i think people are generally pretty savvy enough to know that mm, i'm pretty much not going to make dinner and it's not going to look the process is not going to look like the way it did when this person poured nicely chopped up things out of nice assembled clean bowls and you know <laughs> made this dinner that way you know nobody cooks the way they show it on cooking shows oh i happen to have a quarter cup of melted butter in this glass bowl let me pour it in the pan now you know, nobody cooks that way well similarly with those home shows i i the only one i watch is this old house and i always say to people if you want to watch a, a, a show to actually learn something watch this old house they actually mm. show things that are of you know, value. It's educational and it's entertaining. Yeah. I've never really watched any of the other ones, but from what I understand, they're just, they're primarily entertainment and theater and they're probably similar to the, like the way the cooking shows make cooking look maybe a little less messy than it really is. And yeah. so anyway, they'll often say, oh, and this was all done for $50,000. So don't believe that. Of course, that's nothing new to say, you know, just be prepared that it's going to cost more than you think it's going to cost. Um, and, um, you know, it's very, very valuable to sit down and work with an architect because the process gets you to think about a lot of things that you would not otherwise think about big right. things and small things. And it gets you to focus. Oftentimes homeowners think they know what they want. And then as you, you know, develop, the relationship and you start exploring the possibilities, they, they'll say, you know, I never thought of that, but, you know, let's do that. That could be a good, a good option. And, you know, they learn something new in the process. Whereas if they'd just gone out and hired a builder, the builder would say, well, is that what you want? Okay, let's, let's try to do it. I guess my, my general tips though, were, would be, I think another thing that happens just in our culture, generally speaking, is that people are always looking at trends. 
you know, and so there's all kinds of trends. You know, oh, what's the next thing? Oh, the smart home, the net zero home, the driverless car, you know, all these things. It's worthwhile to look back in history and read, well, what was the big hot trend in the 1960s or the 1950s? You know, did it happen? You know, and, and it's, you know, oftentimes you'll read articles where people will talk about, oh, well, there, there was, we were sure that this was going to be the big trend. You know, everybody was going to be flying around in uh, personal uh, helicopters or so forth and you know did these things happen no change happens in little incremental ways and it often just happens with very mundane things mm -hmm. um so i think it's worth paying attention to those things and not necessarily uh you know putting all the emphasis on the the big trends that are often in my opinion often just like marketing somebody's marketing these things and getting you to believe that it's a trend but that's just my opinion I liked your, your point, too, about the architect bringing relationships to the table. So they have 20, 25, 15, whatever it is, years of experience as an architect, but they're also bringing all of these relationships to the table. So you can hire a contractor, and when it comes time for hiring a mason, you can say, who are you, who are you going to be bringing in on the job? They give you a name, and then you say, well, you know what? I think we should check out this person or this person because I have some experience with them. So that's a great thing that an owner is not really going to have. And my experience is owners, you know, they're going to ask their buddies uh, who they used and they're going to get a name because that person used them, but they're not necessarily going to be the best person for the job. So uh, that's a great thing, especially uh, really experienced architects bring to the table. Yeah, that's that's true. And it's one of these things that, you know, for better or worse, you 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 learn from mistakes and you you know, you learn from trying to repeat the good things and <laughs> not repeating the bad things. <laughs> and you know, it takes time to develop that. Yeah. That's a really good point. We 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 all learn from mistakes. So a homeowner who's never done this before is simply going to they're likely going to make a lot of mistakes they can learn from them, but they really only do this once or twice in their life. Why not bring people in, even if they're not an architect, if they're somebody that has experience making mistakes, making good decisions and bad ones, because they're going to, they're going to benefit from that. Yes, I agree. So we, we are running up on 45 minutes now, Mary. So um, I don't want to take too much of your time. Do you have any sort of last bits of advice or something uh, that you can share with us? Um, yeah, there's one other thing that often comes up and you know, you've probably talked about this on your show before. Um, the, the home as an investment idea. You mm -hmm. know, oftentimes people will say, well, you know, I, I need to do this because, you know, for resale or I need to, uh, you know, I want to, I want to, do this money because I want to do this project because I'm investing in my house. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. doing this, you know, partly because we want it and we need it, but it's also this sort of investment strategy. And, and then this, this also ties into your point about people not knowing what things really cost. So, mm -hmm. so that's when I try to have the, the don't think of your house as an investment vehicle talk, which is that, you know, there are way easier and less stressful ways to invest your money. You know, mutual funds, for example. You know, working on a house is a stressful and, you know, expensive endeavor. And it should not be, in my opinion, done as some sort of investment, like, you know, homeowner investment project. It, it, you're really, you're, you're setting yourself up for probably failure and frustration. You know, I always say to homeowners, do the project because you, for your yourself, you know, because you want to, because it's going to improve your life in some way. Um, it's going to improve the house. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's going to improve the home's value, of course, but don't think of it as some sort of investment strategy. And I think that oftentimes people are somehow fooled or misled into thinking that, you know, just, I guess, simply because it is for many people, the biggest purchase they make. They, they see it, though, therefore, as some sort of investment thing. But the thing I try to remind people is that 
you know, you're living in the house, you're getting utility out of it. So it's, it's a thing that you're using, you know, it's not just this investment that you're now going to try to get all your money back out of. It doesn't necessarily work that way. I know a lot of money, you know, manager types would say the same thing. You know, I'm not, I don't think I'm saying anything new, but for some reason, this attitude seems to persist. Hmm. Excellent. Um, I, I think it's a great point uh, in, in that you end up altering your home. Let's say you have two choices and you go with one over the other because you think that somehow it's going to make it more sellable. Then you live there for 15, right. 20 more <laughs> years and don't enjoy it. And yeah. Why, why do that? So to some extent, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Supposedly in Japan, they have a completely different philosophy about houses. <laughs> they treat them more like cars. They Apparently they use them and when they're done with them, they just tear them down. They don't see them as, you know, you know, like real estate is an investment. They treat it more like you use it when you're done, you know, get rid of it. And the next person puts a different one there. I've never been there, but I've read this before. That's interesting. Yeah. It's just a different philosophy about, about what a house is for. Hmm. But, it's also you know, because the saying, land is so I'm much not, more valuable than the house there. Right. That's sure. True. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying it's a different a different take and i think it's kind of like it, it would be an interesting kind of study i think just to kind of compare what the results of that are versus you know yeah. uh, our system and it's probably there's probably pluses and minuses to each mary how can our listeners find you well i do have a website it's simply my name m-a-r-y-c-e-r-r-o-n-e.com marycerrone.com awesome Thank you very much, Mary, for being with us. Look forward to more conversations with Cran. Yeah, great to have you, Mary. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to the Design Your Dream Home podcast with Doug and Steve. If you have any questions or want to give us any feedback on the show, feel free to reach us through our website at thedougandsteveshow.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>